So good afternoon on this beautiful Sabbath day on the eve of Pentecost as we are here today gathered before the eternal. I know it seems like all we hear is bad news. At least that's how it seems to come across to me. The media is always talking about the negative, how we are losing the war in Afghanistan or Iraq or the war against terrorism somewhere. We're just losing. We just can't win. The media tells us that it's a a civil war in Iraq now. Uh, We should get out. We should not be there. The media is telling us that it's the oil company's fault for the higher prices in oil, fuel oil, for gasoline. It's everybody else's fault. They tell us the bad news, the crime rate, how high statistics are, how many murders, how many rapes, how many suicides. And yes, it is news, but it's bad news. And here we are on the Sabbath day, and we should have our minds focused on something different. Our minds should be focused on the good news. God set aside one day a week, the seventh, the Sabbath day, to tune into the good news. That's why Jesus Christ came. He preached the good news of the kingdom of God. We can get our minds so wrapped up with the bad that when we come to the Sabbath, we can't get the bad out of our heads because it's been there for the past six days. But the Sabbath is a respite. It's an escape. It's a time to come before the eternal. It's a time to come to Him and to recognize that there is good news. And God has given to us a plan of salvation, a plan, a purpose, a goal, a reason for living. All too often, we get bogged down with the nitty-gritty of living. We complain about the higher taxes. Somebody's just being greedy. The, The town, the the county, the the state, they don't need the money. They're just getting rich. So we have our own set of problems. And it comes down even to those in the church having problems financially, having problems spiritually, because the focus is on the negative. The focus is on what is wrong instead of what is right. And I know it takes more money to live. I know it takes a lot of hard work to live in this society. I know that life is not getting easier. I know that it's going to get much harder before it gets any better. But this Sabbath day should picture something to us or for us. It should open our minds to understand more about God. The Sabbath day is a time to come together before the eternal and to experience a little bit of the wonderful world tomorrow. Because that is what the Sabbath day pictures. It pictures the time when Jesus Christ will be here on this earth. The message that He preached, the good news was the kingdom's coming. They, at his, when he walked this earth, they, that is his peers, those in Judah, had the opportunity to hear the message and also see the future king. To see the person who would establish, or I should say reestablish, God's law on this earth. We know that it was taken away. We know that mankind has been cut off from God. We know that's what sin has done to our relationship with God. It has destroyed it. God wants to restore it. He wants to bring about utopia. He wants to bring about peace. He wants to bring about success and goodness and prosperity for each and every human being. But we live in a world that is intent on dividing itself. Intent on destroying itself. 
I can't have mine. I can't have my way because someone else wants their way. So therefore, I will destroy the other person in order to make sure that my way will continue. That I have three squares a day. That I have a place to live. That I will defend my, my, my possessions. God said if we were to lose our life, we would gain eternal life. But the world does not see it that way. The world is out to get for themselves. That's why we have a conflict. Because this world belongs to Satan the devil. He has stirred up the nations against one another. It was prophesied. There would be wars and rumors of wars. Nations fighting against nations. But the kingdom will establish peace. And nations will not lift up sword against nation anymore. And I happen to hear just a little blurb on some of the means that man has devised that sometimes I think puts into proper perspective the history of mankind when it comes to torture. When it comes to extracting information from other people when it comes to, to causing someone else to suffer tremendously before they die. And mankind has always suffered at the hands of his fellow man. Martyrdom. Putting, being put to death for what one believes. And we have great problems today. But where are you and I in the course of history? In the course of walking this earth? We are much closer to the return of Jesus Christ. Is that our forward focus? Is that what we are zeroing in on to, to maintain sanity in a world that's gone insane? The hope that lies within us. We all know Robert Frost. He wrote a very beautiful poem about two roads, a fork in the road, two paths to travel. That he chose to travel the road less traveled. That wasn't necessarily the beaten down path. We come to forks in the road in our own lives. Sometimes we choose the high road. Sometimes we may choose the low road. Have we ever wondered what it might have been if we had made a different choice in our life? There's all kinds of forks in the road. Decisions we have to make. Which way shall we go? Which way leads to eternal life? And, and is what I am doing today leading toward the kingdom or is it taking me further and further away? We get bogged down in the daily struggle to live. It takes food to sustain this physical life. And food doesn't come cheap anymore. Water is very precious. It's not always as clean as it should have been. We need a, a lot of money, so to speak, in order to pay the bills as things begin to cost more and more. So which road are we traveling? Which choice have we made? Which direction are we headed? Are we focusing more on the kingdom of God and the plan of salvation? For God gives to us another day to think about it. Tomorrow is the Feast of Pentecost. What have we been doing the past 50 days? How have we been doing? I know it's been tough. Struggles at work. People mistreating each other. There's always complaining. There's always something going wrong. The engine falls out of the car. 
as bits and pieces go rolling down the asphalt. There's always something to complain about. But what about the big if? What if I had done it God's way instead? Are we tired of this world? Are we tired of the way it's going? Are we, sh- are we making the effort to do it God's way? Luke chapter 13. We walk through the woods if we happen to take the time. If we take the high road through the woods, we get an overview as we get above the tree line, so to speak. We see the valleys below. We see the overview. That's what the high road can do. It can give us an overview of everything that's been going on. The low road brings us down to the little stream that flows through the underbrush. We hear the the gurgling and the bubbling of that water as it flows through the rocks. We see the little butterflies flying through the, the flowers. We might even see some minnows in that little stream. That's the low road. That's getting down to where we can actually see what's going on on a daily basis. The high road gives us the overview. We get up on a high mountain. We can see afar off. We can see further than we can when you're down in the, in the middle of the forest down low in a valley, down through the desert plains. But God has given to us the opportunity to enter into the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ here in Luke chapter 13, verse 22, is going through cities and villages. He's teaching, he's preaching about the soon coming kingdom. It's soon to God because God says a thousand days, I mean a thousand years is like a day. And from the time when Jesus Christ walked this earth till when He returns, it would be like a couple days. He went through the cities and villages of His area. He's going toward Jerusalem. And someone comes up to Him, verse 23, and says, Lord, are there few who are saved? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why am I out here struggling to obey God? Why does it seem like every time I turn around, there's fewer and fewer people at church services? Why is it that the church can't be all united? Why can't we have what we used to have? Feast sites of a hundred thousand or more around the world. Twenty thousand, thirty thousand here and there. No, we're scattered. The question is, are few saved or is there going to be many saved? When Jesus Christ returns, how many is going to be in the kingdom? Who's going to be in the kingdom? We should know the answer. We've come to a fork in the road. Decisions have to be made. Will we continue to obey God today? Because every day we face the same fork. Unless, unless you and I are totally committed, then we don't wake up each morning deciding to obey God. We've already decided to obey God. It's not what if. It's just a matter of when God returns. Luke chapter 13, as we continue, Jesus Christ said, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. There's a fork in the road. Decisions have to be made. It seems like everybody's going a different direction than we are. As Robert Frost said, he chose to go a path that others hadn't traveled very often. It's easy to take a well-beaten path. It's visible. It's 
maybe a lot less filled with obstacles. It's smoother. It's easier to walk it because it's been packed down, beaten down. The, all the limbs, all the twigs, all the rocks have been kind of pushed aside. It's a well-traveled path. I know the auto industry puts out these ads that tells your SUV, that your SUV can travel up and down all the mountains across this nation through rocks, through ravines, across fast-flowing streams, because that's what they show with the ad, nothing will stop your SUV. But what road is smoother? Of course, it's not the interstate system anymore, is it? It used to be a very smooth way to travel, but coming over here today, it seems like I've felt bumps after bumps after bumps. But usually, a well-traveled road is much easier on the feet, on the rear end as you bounce down the road in a car seat. He says, strive to enter through the narrow gate. Strive. That means work. We, we're tired of working, aren't we? So we retire. We put in our 60-some uh, You know, we get 62 years old. We've worked maybe 40 years of our life. We've, we're tired of working. We don't want to work anymore. We want to go fishing. We want to go hunting. We want to go traveling. We want to go sightseeing. We just want to sit down, prop our feet up, and read the newspaper, watch TV, or go to sleep half the time. We're tired of working. But Jesus Christ said we must continue to work, strive to enter through the narrow gate for many. I say to you, we'll seek to enter and will not be able. It's a narrow gate. It's confining. It's constricting. It is limiting. It separates people. If it was easy to go into the kingdom of God, then the majority will be there. But it's not easy. And it's not getting any easier. But the good news is that Jesus Christ is coming back and those who persevere, those who hang in there, those who have striven to enter, will be there. Many will try. They will seek. But they won't find. They won't be able because they're not committed. They're not willing to pay the price. They're not willing to follow through. They're not willing to make right decisions every single day of their lives. Some people feel like the Sabbath is a burden. When will the Sabbath be over so I can get back to work? I don't want to be late getting home tonight because I need to go to work tomorrow. The Sabbath instead should be a delight. It should be time to take all of that of the past week, put it aside, think about what's coming, the role, the purpose, the goal that God has for you and me. If that is not burning deep within us, then there will be a fork in the road and we will make the wrong choice and we'll be going down the other path. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. We must be cognizant about where we are in this walk with God. Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Because when once the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open for us, he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you are from. Does God know who you are? Yes, He does. Does He know if we are His? Yes, He does. Do we know if we are God's? Do we know deep within ourselves that we belong to God? Hopefully these past seven weeks, we have been using the tools that God has given to us to examine ourselves, to be looking at our lives, anticipating tomorrow and all that it portrays, all that it means that we will discuss tomorrow, 
that we have used wisely these past 50 days since the wave sheaf offering as we are in a harvest period. We have been gathering in the wheat and the barley. And there's going to come a time when God says the harvest is over. There isn't any more time. That if I don't intervene in the, full, in, the, in the affairs of mankind, if I don't send my son now, there would be no life left on this planet. And we can see as we witness the news, as we see how hateful people are toward each other, how religions are out to destroy other religions. If you don't believe the way I do, then I will kill you. That will solve the problem. And the hatred, the vehement hatred that's in this world is only increasing. And God is warning you and me that we are to seek eternal life. Seek very diligently. Verse 26, Then we will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence. We went to the feast. We came to Sabbath services. You taught us in the streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know you where you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. And there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. We have no excuse. Because God has given to us His Word. He's called us. He's opened our minds to the truth. He wants us to be in the kingdom of God. But it's our choice. And we must make the right choice. Sometimes we question the choices we make. Maybe I should have been a plumber instead of a bricklayer. Maybe I should have been a musician instead of an artist. Maybe I should have been an accountant instead of a lawyer. Maybe I should have married my sweetheart in high school. Maybe I should have lived in Montana. Maybe I should have lived somewhere else. Do we question what's be behind us? Do we? Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Do we have apprehensions? What if I had taken the other fork in the road? What if I had made a different choice in life? And I'm sure those who are teenage mothers, pregnant, out of wedlock, facing the decision of do I get an abortion or do I have this baby? Do I give the baby up? Do I struggle through life? Maybe they wish they made a different choice in life. Luke chapter 9, verse 62. But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Do you and I see God's hand in our lives? Do you see where God has led us to make right choices? Do you see where God has intervened and spared us? For He says He will spare us like children. Do you see God working in your life? Do I see God working in my life? Do I have to question the decisions that I have made? Do, am I always looking back? Because if I am, if I look back, if I am not satisfied with what I have today, if I felt that I have been cheated, that I have been missing out on life, and a lot of people must have felt that way because they're not here with us today, they have looked back. They have looked back and decided that the world 
the church on the corner that has services tomorrow as they do every week is a much better place to be than this little tiny group, this persecuted group, this little offshoot of a group, this whatever that is clinging to the truth of God. Now, that's not where the truth is. It's out here somewhere else. Going back into the world, going back to what one has had before, is not fit for the kingdom of God. Is that what we think about? If we had made a different choice? Why did God have to call me now? Why couldn't I have fun now? Why couldn't I repent later? Why couldn't God call me when I was 72 on my deathbed? Then that would have been nice. I could have had a, a beautiful life. But you see, I don't look at it like that. I look at my walk with God as a very beautiful walk with God. Do I second guess the choices I've made? No. I'm happy with where I am today with God. Isn't that what Paul said? Whatever state that we find ourselves in, whether we're a little hungry, whether we're a little thirsty, whether the rain's beating down on our head, whether we're out here slaving, working day and night to provide for our families, whatever state we're in, be content. Be happy. Because what God has for us will not will be so great that we will not remember all the struggles, all the pain, and all the suffering that we are going through today. So I ask the question, how committed are we? Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Paul, in talking to the church there in Colossae, writes this in verse 9, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. See, that's the problem with most people. They're self-centered. All they see is themselves, what they want out of life, what they can get out of life. Don't cross my path. Don't pull the rug out from under me. I'm out here to please the self. The Apostle Paul said he did not cease to pray for other people. Is our mind focused on the needs of others? We walk this world with others. No man is an island unto himself. We are united as God's children. It is God's creation. All of mankind. Doesn't matter where they live, what nationality, what race, what sex, what language. We are all God's children. We should act like God's children. But we don't. We don't. Paul prayed for those in God's church. And what was he asking for God to do? That you and I might be filled with the knowledge of His will. God has given to us a plan of salvation. A purpose of being here on this earth. Most of mankind is not being called today. Yes, they are God's children, but He has not begotten them spiritually. He's created them. God is the awesome Creator. But as David said, and asked God to do something, was to create in Him a clean heart. God's created us physically. He's created us to be able to step with His Spirit into a new dimension, into the kingdom of God. 
So Paul is praying that God would fill them with the knowledge of his will. Are you and I filled with the knowledge of God's will? Or are we stumbling down the road wondering if we had made the right choice? As we approach another fork in the road, now which way do I go? Another choice. Another decision. I'm tired of making decisions. Why can't Christianity be easy? Why can't Christianity be a piece of cake? Isn't it true? Once saved, always saved. Oh, how much easier that would be. Oh, Jesus Christ has done it all for you and me. It's all nailed to the cross. That's the easy path. That's the broad way. God has given to us a narrow path, a narrow gate, a way that's constricting, confining for a reason. He wants to see how committed we are. He had to find that commitment in Abraham. He had to find that commitment in Daniel. He had to find that commitment in the apostles. He had to find that commitment in everyone that's written in Hebrews chapter 11. Moses. Moses. God had to find the commitment in Moses. It took 80 years. It took 80 years for God to find that commitment. You and I have already observed the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But that should not have stopped us from eating spiritual unleavened bread. The seven days have long gone of putting out the physical leavening. But what has the spiritual unleavened bread done for you and me? Moses had to learn some very tough lessons. Forty years being in the court of Pharaoh, he came to a fork in the road. He had to make a choice. Hebrews tells it better than maybe I can. A fork in the road. Hebrews chapter 11. Verse 24, By faith Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He was going places. He was next in line. Pharaoh's daughter. The son of Pharaoh's daughter, okay? He was to sit on the throne. But he decided that's not what he needed to do choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he looked to the kingdom of God. He looked to the future. He looked beyond the here and now. He looked beyond all the glory of Egypt, all the prestige, all the power, all that he could have had. And he went out and he killed an Egyptian. Did he not? Yes, he did. He killed us. He killed someone. He murdered someone. He thought he was doing the will of God. He thought he was doing what was right. Well, the next day, he decided that he could mediate between two of his own people. And they said, well, you're going to settle it the way you settled it yesterday? Which one of us are you going to kill? You know what he had to do? He had to flee Egypt. He had to flee from the wrath of Pharaoh. Pharaoh was out to kill him now. What a choice Moses made. The next 40 years he learned He learned how to eat the unleavened bread. How did he learn? By taking care of sheep 
on the back side of a mountain, wandering from pasture to pasture, from a little bit of grass to a little bit of something else to find water when it didn't rain. Do you think he was living in oases? Do you think God always provided rain for those sheep and green grass for 40 years? Do you not think there might have been a time of drought? A time of hardship? See, I don't think sometimes we put our feet in the shoes of these people, in the sandals or whatever they wore, and really think about their circumstances. That's not any different than today. Moses learned humility, did he not? You and I are to learn humility by eating of Jesus Christ. He forsook Egypt and he learned how to walk with God. Which choice to make? Which path to take? Did he ever look back? Did he ever say, oh, I wish I not killed that man. I wish I could still be in Egypt. I wish I could still have all that glory and honor. No. He never looked back, and here's why. By faith. By faith he first took Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. It's sad, but we all get tied down to the nitty-gritty of living and we don't see God as clearly as we should. These all died in faith. Chapter 11, verse 13. Not having received the promises. Some of us may go to the grave not having received the promises. But having seen them afar off, we're assured of them. Committed dedicated, loyal, faithful. It's not a pipe dream. It's not somebody's imagination. It's not the, the elusive fountain of youth. It's not the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's, some, it's not some fairy tale. The reality of the kingdom may be hard to grasp in our puny little physical minds. But if we have faith and if we have the Spirit of God, if we've been eating the unleavened bread, then we will embrace those promises and confess that we're just walking this earth and we've chosen to walk the path less traveled because very few find the kingdom of God. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a place that they can call home. Not Montana, not Virginia, not Texas, not even Tahiti or the Caribbean islands, as beautiful as those may be. But we are seeking a homeland, the kingdom of God, that will be established on this earth when Jesus Christ returns. But that is not the end. That is but the beginning. For if they had truly called to mind the country from which they had come, where God called you and me, the condition, the state, the existence that we had before God called us, if we would think about that, bring that to mind, constantly think about the past, then what happens? They would have had opportunity to return. So should we think about the past? The Apostle Paul says, forgetting those things which are behind, I press forward, onward, to the high calling of Jesus Christ, which is the kingdom of God. Yes, if we think about the past, we begin to deceive ourselves. We think how great the 1920s were. Surely the historians have it right. 
Surely that must have been the best age in the United States of America's history. The Roaring Twenties. Oh, how I longed to have lived back then. Going up and down the road in my Model T or Model A. Oh, how beautiful that would have been. If they had, had, uh, they, if they had thought about it, we, and if we think about it, we would find a way to return. Because the brain begins to embellish the past. And we lose the perspective. We lose the actuality of it. And it becomes much greater much magnificent, more magnificent. It becomes utopia. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. That is what God is doing. Back to Colossians. Let's continue in verse 10. What's the will of God? Verse 9. That you and I might be filled with the knowledge of His will. What is God doing? The Sabbath day should be a foretaste of the wonderful world tomorrow. The beginning of God's plan of salvation. He's coming back to set up the kingdom. He's coming back to restore what has been taken away from this world. He's coming back to fill this world with the knowledge of God. Just as the waters cover the oceans today and how vast the oceans are, God's knowledge is not that vast today. Only a few have it. Only a few have been blessed to know God's will, His purpose, His goals. His desires. His desires is to have a family. He's, he's tired of being two beings. The Father and the Son. He, he, he wants to give everything to you and me and to all of mankind. We don't even begin to see the end of the universe. And yet He's promised a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. And He's coming down. The Father's coming to this earth when all is done, when, when the last human being is converted and changed to spirit. A new heavens and a new earth of which the kingdom has no end. Which galaxy do you and I want? Which piece of the universe would you like to cohabit? with some special friend? Which star would you enjoy? And that's only the beginning because we don't even see what God has in store, His plan. We're not going to sit around strumming harps all day long. That's boring. I get satisfaction out of life when I go down to the garden and I see the crops growing. And I know a lot of work has been put in, into it to fertilize, to irrigate, to, to embellish the earth. And it's a team effort. My wife spends hours in the garden, the vegetable garden, the flower gardens, so she can get up in the morning and see the beautiful roses and see the beautiful peonies See the beautiful daffodils and the irises, the pansies and the peonies. All of it. It takes work. But that's what I enjoy. God made us to work. Did it not say strive to enter into the kingdom of God? Work. He told Adam and Eve, take care of the garden. Dress it and keep it. And that doesn't happen by sitting on the bed, looking out and wishing that there was a gardener that you could go tell and say, hey, go, go prune that peach tree today. God wants us involved 
in what he is doing. And so he's given to us a physical earth, and we are to work on this earth to develop some very important lessons. And the droughts come, and there's famine, and God wants us to see, or God wants to see how committed we are when times aren't always the best. We are to be filled, overflowing. It should bubble up and out of us, the knowledge of God's will. We should be able to explain it, teach it, because God is looking for people who are able to teach in the world tomorrow. In all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you and I may have a walk Worthy of God. Fully pleasing Him. Being fruitful in every good work. And increasing in the knowledge of God. Each year is different in the garden. Each year is a different experience. This year, the potatoes look extremely well. Onions look well, but that hasn't always been the case in the past. Each year is a different experience. And it should be an increasing experience with God. A deeper walk with God. Moses learned that day by day and year by year as he took care of sheep on the backside of the mountain. So then when God called him at the age of 80, he was ready to do what? Shepherd his people. Moses had been through everything. There wasn't anything that he couldn't handle except he couldn't handle the job. He says, God, you've got the wrong person. Have you and I questioned God's decision? God, you shouldn't have called me. You've got the wrong person. You shouldn't have called me. You've got the wrong person. You should have called someone else. Moses says, I can't talk. I can't speak. My tongue's tied. God says, well, who made your mouth? What excuse do we throw up in the face of God that we aren't committed as well as we should be to doing His work of reaching out to the kingdom of God? Being fruitful in every good work. Increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might, verse 11, according to His glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Moses learned the hard way. All of God's people have had to learn the hard way. It's a struggle to obey God. It's not easy. That's why we must work from sun up to sundown day in and day out, and then come to the Sabbath and shout with joy, be enthralled with enthusiasm that this is God's day of rest. Thankful for the Sabbath day. Thankful for the respite. Thankful that we can get everything off of our minds that's been plaguing us this past week and come to God and say, teach us more about Your will and Your purpose. Moses learned how to take care of sheep and he learned in the process of how to take care of people because he not... I mean, he had two and a half to three million people to take care of. I have a hard enough time taking care of one person, myself. Moses had the responsibility to take the sheep the nation of Israel out of Egypt and lead them to the kingdom of God, which was the promised land. Not the actual spiritual kingdom, but it was a type of the kingdom of God. And God is leading us toward the kingdom of God, but as you know, they had all kinds of doubts. 
They had all kinds of problems. They couldn't get the Egypt out of their minds. They couldn't get the world out of their minds. They couldn't value the Sabbath day. They didn't value manner. They didn't value anything of God. But we should value the things of God. The glorious power of God. The awesome Creator that He is. Who's able to create in you and me the clean heart that we need. As I mentioned earlier in Psalms chapter 51. Why did David ask God to do that? Why did God need to create a clean heart in David? Well, David had sinned. He knew better. You and I know better. If we still sin, David had an excuse. He was king. King's entitled to anybody in the kingdom. His word is law. At least that's what he thought. That he was above God's law. At least for that moment. But you and I are supposed to be under authority. Is that not what Jesus Christ experienced when he was talking to the centurion? The centurion says, I am a man under authority. Under authority. And yet I say to someone, go, and he goes. That's, that's faith, Jesus Christ said. David had to learn the hard way. He says, verse 11, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And tomorrow is an anniversary of the outpouring of God's Spirit upon His people. This is Psalms chapter 51. He says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous Spirit. Why? Why do I need a clean heart? Why do I need God in my life? Why must the Creator who's made the physical create something spiritual in you and me? It's then I will be able to teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Read. Read the prophets. Read about what God is going to do. How He's going to bring to Himself a special people. Zion. Teachers that are able to preach and to teach in the world tomorrow. This is the way, walk you in it. When people decide that maybe they have a better way than God's way. God intends us to be in His family. Do we? Or are we still questioning the decisions we've made? The path we have chosen? We look back, don't we? Hopefully we don't. Hopefully we don't look back. Because that's the lesson about Lot's wife. Don't look back. Robert Frost, he didn't look back. In the poem, he was very content to have walked the path that he had chosen. God hadn't called Robert Frost, but God has called you and me to walk a path, not one that we have chosen. We've surrendered to God. We've submitted to Him. He's opened our minds to the truth. We are decided to obey Him. And now He lays out before us a path, a process, in order to achieve the goal, the kingdom of God. God has given to us the tools, the means to go forward. How committed are we? Are we loyal and faithful to God? There's one very deep example, very magnificent example of a person that was committed to go God's way. And that was Ruth. Don't have time to go into it all. But you know what she said. She says, Entreat me not to leave you. I've made up my mind. I am committed. Moab is not where I want to live. Moab is not my future. 
The future is with you, Naomi, and back with you to Judah. Your God will be my God. Where you live, I will live. And where you die, I will die. And only death will separate the two of us. Commitment. She was committed to Naomi, and Naomi was going back to God, and Ruth also was going to go with God. Read the story about Ruth. Her commitment. As I said, all of God's people who are going to be in the kingdom are committed. Not second guessing, not wishing about something that might have happened, but are totally dedicated to serve the eternal this day and tomorrow no matter what tomorrow may bring, because the future burns brightly in their minds. I ask you this question as you travel the road less traveled, as you go down a path that others have gone, but very few, are you and I dedicated, committed to stay the course?